There we go. Okay. Excellent. Um, I know that we may have some new folks here tonight. So if anybody uh, wants to put in their chat where, you know, if they're growing anything they're excited about this year, or maybe starting a garden for the first time, just introduce yourself. Um, for those of you who were not part of our um, presentation last night, my name is Hannah Mosca. I am the farm and greenhouse manager for Grow Pittsburgh. I manage um, three sites, uh, Shiloh Farm, which you can see here in this picture. These are tomatoes from our farm last year with uh, tons of flowers on our tomato plants um, with the solar panels. That's a very distinguishing uh, feature uh, at Shiloh Farm are the solar panels right on the corner lot. Uh, the Frick Greenhouse, part of the Frick Greenhouse, and um, we are building, currently building greenhouses at Garden Dreams, which is a plant nursery that existed for 20 years before Garden, uh, before Grow Pittsburgh took over management this year. Um, the previous owner, Mindy, donated the land to the Allegheny Land Trust, so it will be in uh, perpetuity used for um, uh, urban agriculture, which is really exciting. So, um, so we are just going to pick up, we're going to overlap just a little bit with where we left off last night, which is really um, now that we know the things that we're taking into consideration for our garden, where we're going to be building it because of sunlight and wind and slope and drainage, um, what kind of garden we're going to be building. Now we're going to get to the garden planning and figure out what we are going to plant. So again, we talked on this last night just real quick, but it'll just be a few slides here that we're gonna overlap. So planting at the right time, this is super important because otherwise if we plant things, um, you know, it can be so heartbreaking if we plant things outside and they're not quite ready to be out there, if they're temperature sensitive or um, maybe they would just be stunted if they don't die. But um, these are all things that are great to plant outside. Um, some of them right now, peas, carrots, onions, radishes, turnips, you can plant those outside now. Um, and April 15 is our last hard freeze. So that's when the ground will start to, you know, it'll still fluctuate. Certainly we'll still get frosts, but the hard freeze of the ground will really change after that April 15. And we'll have a lot more flexibility with what we can plant after that. Um, then warm season, these are things that have to be after the last frost date. Basil is extremely temperature sensitive. It doesn't even have to frost. It just has to be like, even in the thirties, basil can just completely go downhill quickly after that. So um, really making sure we're paying attention to the temperatures when we're planting basil, beans, cucumbers, eggplants, melons, peppers, tomatoes, zucchini, all of those are definitely frost sensitive. And we wanna wait till after our frost date, May 15. Um, and just a quick note for anyone who wasn't here last night, the little information in the bottom, the info hub at the bottom right corner, that is going back to our website, uh, Grow Pittsburgh. We have um, information um, in our info hub about all different topics and anything that sort of coordinates with something on the website. I've just listed the title of the info hub information there for you. Um, uh, thinking about where we're planting things is super important. Thinking about the garden design, you can see here the corn is on the going to be on the furthest north facing because we don't want that corn. If it was um, planted on the southern side, it would shade out things behind it the way the sun um, comes onto the garden. So we want to make sure that that's on the most northern side. So that everything um, growing in front of it is shorter and able to get all the sun and the corn will be able to grow nice and tall and get that sun too. So um, this way they're not competing for the sunshine. So thinking about sort of the aesthetics and the design of the garden based on height. And spacing, we'll talk about this a little bit um, more in uh, transplanting as well, but thinking about how each crop has its own unique spacing. I grabbed here a little um, packet. I'll just keep referencing this, but um, it always has information here. This says direct seed, two inches apart, one inch depth. It's a bean, so that means it's going to be a pretty big seed, so likely gets buried pretty deep. Um, generally, the um, rule of thumb is planting um, the same size that it is the, that much depth. So if it's a really small seed, it can be right close to the surface. Whereas uh, something that's a uh, big bean seed, an inch deep is great. So looking at how deep and then um, looking at what kind of sunshine it needs. So that helps us plan for the spacing of the entire bed, thinking about the room for the roots, thinking about the shading, like we just talked about with corn. And then we really wanna give things space because we don't want them to be competing with each other. All the things that we plant, we wanna make sure they have sufficient nutrients and water. So, 
Um, we're going to talk about how we choose what we want to grow. And I've got a couple different um, things that are helpful to be able to figure out what to plant. Somebody mentioned growing herbs in containers yesterday. Here's a lovely photo of some um, perennial and annual herbs in containers, thinking about small things in small spaces. And then on the right, looking at the um, probably a pumpkin or some kind of um, large probably winter squash based on the size, although zucchini plants, if anybody's grown a zucchini plant, you know it can get huge, um, but giving those lots of space, making sure we're not growing that in a really tiny pot because it won't, it won't produce um, tons of uh, vegetables like it will if it is given adequate space. So small crops for small spaces, larger crops for larger spaces. Um, and really, I mean, this is this is what it all comes down to is what do you like to eat? Planting things that make sense for um, what your lifestyle is and what you like to eat and um, those kinds of things. So these are all pictures of things I grew last year, either at my house or at the farm I manage at Shiloh. Um, the top left, you can see I have just a bunch of herbs there, all from my herb garden. This is a variety of hot peppers I grew. Um, the logs at the top there are shiitake mushrooms. We'll um, be teaching a workshop coming up in April, um, all about growing your own um, mushrooms, if you're interested in that. And then the one below it, that's the wine cap. When I was talking yesterday about establishing those new perennial beds to not fight the shade of the um, street trees, those are the wine cap mushrooms that grow right out of the wood chips, which is really awesome. And it starts to break those down and add organic matter to the soil. And then you get an awesome crop out of it as well. So that's sort of a different way of garden planning. But if you're gonna be using wood chips as mulch, they're a fabulous thing to just sort of incorporate into the garden. Um, to the right there are the loofahs. Those are a, um, you know, a natural sponge. They grow their uh, a, a big, I should actually find a photo of what the, um, what the vegetable looks like when it's growing, but it's a, in the squash family and it um, has really tender fruits that you can eat when they're little. But if you let them grow for the full season and dry out, then you can grow sponges. So that's a, another thing you could incorporate into your garden. On the bottom right there, I have lots of dahlias, obviously tomatoes, always grow tomatoes every year. I say, I'm gonna cut down on the tomatoes I grow and I have not been successful in that yet. Um, and in my yard, I plant a lot of garlic. Um, those are some of the garlic I planted last year. And I planted 200 in my personal garden last year. So we dedicate a lot of space to garlic because it's something that we use when we preserve and cook all season. So um, garlic's one of the main things I grow at home. And I, at the farm stand, when I'm planning for the farm, we plan for the weekly farm stand and what people want to purchase there. Whereas at my home garden, I plant a lot of beans and potatoes and garlic, things that are storage crops, because that's a great way to balance what I'm getting uh, from Shiloh Farm, um, our Braddock Farms, our sister site. Um, and so I really focus on things that uh, are storage crops that we can eat through the whole winter time and are just different than what we grow at the farm but this should really guide what kind of garden you plant. There's no point in planting something that you're not excited to eat or put on your table or whatever it is. So, um, so when we're choosing varieties, you know, there are so many thousands of varieties out there of, of all different crops. Um, and so when we're looking at all the different things, there's many things that we can take into consideration. Um, days to maturity, um, that usually says it right on the uh, seed packet or in a seed catalog. And so these dry beans are 80 to 90 days, whereas actually all the dry beans are probably pretty close to that, but something like a green bean might be closer to 50 to 60 days. So it would produce a lot faster. Um, here, because we are in zone 6B, we have a pretty good um, growing season, but certainly nothing like say California or Florida. So days to maturity is important in our growing zone because if we're looking at something that's say 110 days and we can't plant it till after the frost, we won't get that many, even if it does produce before the frost, we won't, wouldn't get necessarily uh, as large of a harvest as something that was maybe 85 days and would then produce for weeks longer than something that's 110 days. So the days to maturity is certainly a consideration Consideration, but um, but we do have a lot of um, a lot of flexibility with that because we can do some season extension and things like that. But good to understand how 
quickly you'll be able to um, harvest those. It's also really important in garden planning because I think I mentioned this last night that if we plant something like lettuce, we could plant rows of radishes uh, right between them and harvest those radishes before the lettuce is even really getting that big. And then we're really getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things grown in a smaller space. That's called inter interplanting. Um, productivity, a lot of times um, things have been, you know, created because they produce more. That might be a different variety, you know, even within the family of say jalapenos, there's many different varieties of jalapenos. And maybe you want one that produces earlier um, so that you start harvesting them maybe in July, but you also want one that's gonna produce a ton of them and that might produce later. So you can really even balance that by thinking about um, how they all would grow together. Productivity is certainly something that we think about a lot at our farm because we want to make sure we do have food every week for our farm stand. So that's something that we prioritize a lot. Um, and whereas maybe at my house, it, I might prioritize flavor and color instead of productivity because I'm not trying to supply a weekly um, produce stand. And maybe um, the, the another thing about productivity is that it could be that it produces uh, something like a determinate tomato will put on all of its fruit all at once, whereas an indeterminate tomato will produce fruit over the long season. So understanding how the um, plant produces um, fruit or greens or whatever it is, is also really important. Um, flavor and color. I was just um, on the phone with a, with a woman who was talking about how they plan their entire pepper garden around having colors and peppers for the entire season so that any any point in the season, they'll be harvesting every color of pepper, um, which I, I really loved the um, image of that as well. And certainly at our farm stand, we think about color and all the um, different ways that things look together. Um, and obviously flavor. Flavor is the most important um, in a lot of ways because we want to make sure that what we're growing is delicious. And so um, we can really pick certain tomatoes that have different flavor profiles. Certainly peppers obviously can range a whole lot in flavor. Some super sweet, some have like smoky notes, um, certainly in heat levels, those can change a lot. So good in heat or cold. And this is uh, both important um, because we want things that are cold tolerant in the springtime, but in the summertime, um, something like a lettuce, there are certain varieties of lettuces that do much better in the heat than, um, than others. And so knowing which one is best um, for the heat or for the cold, um, you can really extend your season just by choosing the proper variety. And um, I had my, here it is my Johnny's um, seed catalog. I, I'm just gonna keep talking about Johnny's because I think they, their catalog, um, I mentioned them last night for their seed cattle or their seed starting calendar. Um, I really think they have such a good um, amount of information here. And they have something called their head lettuce program. I know this is online as well. It's way too small for you to be able to read on that screen, but essentially it goes through early, mid and late season. It'll tell you exactly what varieties you should plant so that in the middle of the summer, when it's really hot, say, you know, this last summer, we had multiple weeks with just like over like 90 degrees plus that's way too hot for lettuce generally. So picking specific varieties can really help extend your um, season and just get a better yield from what you're growing. Taking into consideration your whether the thing is a perennial, an annual, or a biennial, meaning that it'll grow something like a carrot would stay in the ground for a full um, year and then start to produce seeds and die the next year. So things are, that are biennials will grow for two years. Um, and then maybe organic is a consideration for you, both either in seeds or in seedlings. Um, that would be a thing that you could certainly um, look for. And something that's not on here that should be is thinking about hybrid or heirloom. That's definitely a consideration for people, um, whether something's open pollinated or heirloom. Heirloom has a specific definition. Um, I forget exactly how many years, but that it's been... Um, you know, that the seeds have been saved and passed down um, for generations. 
And so we know that whereas a hybrid is something we grow a lot of hybrids on our farm too. There's um, nothing necessarily wrong. I think a lot of times people think that hybrid means genetically modified, which is totally different. Um, hybrids are where essentially you could be a farmer and go out and try and get um, qualities of two different tomatoes and crossbreed them, you know, um, match the pollen from those and pollinate um, and create a new tomato. And that's what people do for, for a long time. And those can be hybrids. And um, so that's, I just wanted to make a plug because I feel like a lot of times there's like some confusion over um, something that's like made in a lab and hybrids are, are um, something that we often plant on our farm too. Thinking about diversity, um, this is Shiloh Farm and a couple different things. The picture on the left, you can see we've got a row of flowers, then we've got some zucchini, we've got a row of tomatillos and some, I think winter squash there, maybe some beans in there too. Um, thinking about that will help with uh, pests and diseases. This milkweed plant right in the center. Uh, this was like growing right up in the center of our bed, but I didn't have the heart to pull it out. So um, loved to see the monarchs on that because it's creating habitat and attracting beneficial insects to our farm. Um, so that that is certainly creating diversity. And that's a great example because that's mostly tomatoes, but is still adding and attracting pollinators to that space. And then I just, well, I liked this picture all the way on the right because that's a row of tomatoes, a row of peppers, and then a row of tomatoes. But you can see at each, the end of each bed, we have marigolds and basil to attract um, beneficial insects as well. So just because even on the farm, when we have, you know, straight rows of, of all one crop, there still is, are lots of ways to incorporate diversity. The picture all the way on the left is maybe more of that, but still the picture on the right, we're thinking about um, incorporating other plants into both for aesthetic and for pests and diseases. Um, so one thing that um, is really important is sourcing seed from a place that is uh, a reputable seed company, meaning that you can count on their seed being, um, you know, uh, we multiple different things, but one of them is just like knowing that you will get quality seeds because there, there are a lot of seeds out there and, and some companies have, um, you know, higher standards in terms of quality and in terms of germination rates and those kinds of things. These are probably the four that we buy most of our seeds from. That's Fedco. They're really, um, if you ever are wanting a really beautiful seed catalog, Fedco is one of the best uh, that drawing there. It's pretty representative. Their entire catalog is black and white drawings and um, like little sketches. It's gorgeous. Um, High Mowing is a really wonderful company as well as Baker Creek. Um, and then Johnny's is the one I've mentioned multiple times um, and where we buy a lot of our seeds. So these are all great. They also have just a lot of information on the website, which I think, um, you know, the more that we can learn when we're buying seeds and things, I think the more helpful and more successful our gardens can be. So I just wanted to stop um, to maybe take some questions if there are any before we go into the next things about direct seeding and transplanting. But if there's any sort of general garden planning questions, I'd love to take them now. Right. Well, we did have, we have a question about mm. growing pumpkins. Mm. It looks like Heidi, some years she gets a lot of pumpkins, specifically the jack-o'-lantern kind. And then some years, it's not so lucky. Do you have any tips? Um, that might be a pollination issue. If, if the plants are big and healthy and they look like they should be producing lots of um, pumpkins, then it could be pollination. And so maybe just making sure that they're planted in a way, in a place that the sunshine is looking crazy in my, my uh, little office here. But um, yeah, I would say it could be pollination. So making sure that there are other flowers around to attract, um, especially bumblebees are really great for bumblebees and honeybees are great for uh, cucurbits. So, um, and uh, Margaret had a question about adding um, compost and preparing the soil for plants. Do plants need different amounts? How do we know how much to add? Um, apart from just, you know, getting your soil checked and making sure that it's, it's decent. Yeah, we will talk about bed prep uh, in the next section. Oh, okay, great. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Heidi says, sometimes the pumpkin plants just don't grow that much. 
So I grow pumpkins every year, Heidi. I am not the professional, so I can can over uh, can speak over your spec. But I've noticed they require a lot of um, compost, a lot of fertilizer. They're really heavy feeders. So I personally have the best luck with the mini pumpkins. Um, but the jack o' lantern ones are great fun. You just have to really keep an eye on them, keep rotating them so they don't get lopsided and no side gets soggy and right. pests. Because that's the worst when you have a big, beautiful pumpkin in your yard and then you go to turn it over and it's like, oh no. Yeah. So those are my subtle tips. But yeah, that's a great point about compost. That's why, um, you know, oftentimes you'll get like a volunteer pumpkin plant right out of your compost pile because they love that really um, nutrient rich compost. Pumpkins, particularly, uh, well, winter squash in general, really love um, compost. So I would say, yeah, if they're just not growing that much, then I think it's probably a, a nutrient thing. So compost, um, where a, the pollination would be if you have big healthy plants and it looks like you should have lots of pumpkins. Whereas if the plants are not growing much, I would give them, yeah, a boost of compost or um, even fish emulsion, like I mentioned yesterday, that would be a really great thing for, for pumpkins. And then just making sure that they've got lots of sun. If you're planting them, um, they definitely want lots of sun. And Sonia and Pidge had a question about how do you get wine cap spores for oh, <laughs> mycelium? I don't think I said it right. Yeah, but that's a great question. So um, you can buy it. You can buy it from a place. I um, I'm from Wisconsin originally. So there's this company in um, Wisconsin called Field and Forest, and they sell lots of different kinds of mushroom spawn. Um, the other thing is that our workshop in February uh, we will be sending people home with uh, wine cap mycelium and um, hopefully shiitake logs as well. So that's going to be a really fun, um, a really fun workshop. So um, that's a great way. Once you have the wine caps established, what's so great is that they just continue to spread. And then you can use the wood chips that are inoculated with the wine cap spores and spread those to other parts of your garden. You can put them in pots to use them as mulch. And they'll just continue to spread. And um, a cool trick you can do is to spread them out on cardboard and they'll actually then um, do like the mycelium run through the cardboard. And then you can spread that out throughout your garden too. So the wine caps are really wonderful. Um, you know, they do make the wood chips break down a little bit faster. So you might have to mulch more often, but, um, but they're great. So um, yeah, Field and Forest is the company that I have bought to like get the things started. That's what we've bought from. And we went through Grow Pittsburgh when we've done shiitake logs and lion's mane and lots of different things. Um, we've bought all of that through Field and Forest. They're also a really wonderful company to be able to call and ask questions, which is really nice. I always appreciate that. Okay, we'll put the Field and Forest right here in the chat in case anyone Perfect. is curious. And then it looks like Christine had a question about, will we talk about companion planting? Um, will we talk about companion planting? I'm not sure if I have, um, any in here, but we can definitely talk about that, um, after we go through a couple of the other things, because I think companion planting is, yeah, is really wonderful. And that's, um, certainly something we can touch on. Um, should we keep moving then? Yeah. Let's okay, go. great. So plant beginnings, this is just all about getting your garden started. We're going to talk about the difference between direct seeding and transplanting. Some things will do much better by direct seeding versus transplanting. Um, actually, most things would do really well from direct seeding. We just don't have the time because we have seasons here. We don't have the time to direct seed. We Planting a tomato seed in the ground would not be very successful. Whereas something like um, a radish or beans, corn, squash, those things are great direct seedings. <laughs> Um, so that really just means exactly what it sounds like. It means we're going to place that seed directly on the soil where it's going to grow for its lifetime. That means that's direct seeding. We're going to do beans and mostly beans and peas this way. Usually we plant root crops this way and squash and cucumbers. All of those, especially because a lot of those are bigger seeds too. They're really easy to plant because we can see exactly where the seeds um, are that we planted um, and have a better sense of, of those. And they just germinate really well 
um, when direct seeded. Root crops is more about the fact that the roots are sensitive because that is the part of the plant that we are eating. So they don't always transplant as well. That being said, as a farmer, we do transplant a lot of these things. That's to get a jump start on um, successions of things because we have such a tight timeline that we're trying to um, plant things. So you certainly can transplant these. There's no not, nothing to say you can't, but they're great things to come um, to direct seed. Um, that would be true for radishes as well. And I would add to this, I think um, things that are off, off, like really great for direct seeding are things like leaf lettuce and arugula, um, really quick leafy greens are awesome to be direct seeded, as well as things like cilantro and dill. Those are also fast growing herbs that would really do great um, direct seeded. Um, and then that again is talking about looking at our seed packet. I have one here from Seed Savers Exchange. This is one I did not um, list because there's I, by no means are the four companies that I listed, they're the only reputable seed uh, companies. There's so, so many wonderful seed companies out there. Seed Savers Exchange, um, I ordered a bunch of dry beans. I'm gonna be growing these in my own yard and there's so many really beautiful ones that I'm very excited about. So, um, but here I'm gonna look and it says, it says right on here, direct seed. Um, two inches apart. So it's very clear. It's very easy to know exactly what I'm doing. It also tells me the depth. It also tells me how much space between them. This one also tells me that it's a bush habit, which also um, is helpful for me to know whether I need to put a trellis to grow something up, especially for beans. Many of them are vining. Let's see, this one is also bush. I think I went kind of heavy on the bush dry beans, so there might not be any here that are um, pole beans, but, um, but that is helpful to know when we're direct seeding, whether we wanna have a trellis available for the plants to grow up, but all of these ones are bush beans. So I'm just gonna plant those and then um, and let them grow. So, um, and this does not, this one actually doesn't tell me the spacing, but this one does. Here it says rows apart. 36 to 48 inches. I definitely do not follow that. I plant them way closer than that. Um, I will follow the amount of space between them, which is two on this one as well. But I will probably, in my three foot bed, I'll probably plant three rows of beans, which is about 12 inch spacing between the, the rows instead of 36 to 48. And that's because I don't have a machine going through. It's just gonna be me and my hands picking these beans. So as long as I know that the soil fertility is really great and that the soil life can support that many plants, um, you can absolutely grow those a little bit closer. I don't want them on top of each other, but I do want to uh, grow more than one every one row every three feet. That would be kind of crazy. So. Um, that information is also in a seed catalog. When you're comparing and trying to figure out which one you want to do, um, a seed catalog is also a really great way to get that information. So when we are direct so seeding, this is a really great picture of peas being planted. Again, I like direct seeding those things that have big seeds. We can see exactly where we planted our seeds. So to prepare the seed bed, the biggest thing usually is that um, for seeds specifically, is that um, if our seed bed uh, is very rough and has like big chunks of things, it might be really hard for seeds to germinate, especially small seeds like something like lettuce and those kinds of things. The peas will probably be just fine, but um, especially thinking about our smaller seeds, having a really, um, uh, what's the right word, even uh, level bed is really great. So we want to break up any of those clumps, especially for small seeds. We want to wet the soil slightly. We don't, we do not want to plant um, seeds in dry soil because what will happen is we'll plant those seeds. We'll start to water it. And then all that water, because the soil is maybe really dry, it'll just run off. And maybe our seeds will also run off. And then we all have no idea where the seeds went or where they've landed. Um, and maybe they'll still grow, but they won't grow in the place that we want them to be. So making sure the soil is slightly, um, moistened before planting our seeds is really great for being able to then water them in. Um, creating a trench or a band to appropriate depth is really nice because these peas, we know exactly, we want them all to be one inch. So if we just create a little trench that's all one inch, that makes it really easy for appropriate spacing um, between the plants and also the appropriate depth. So a trench is really easy for that. 
and then you just put your seeds in. You can see these, um, I don't have any peas in front of me, but probably similar to beans every couple of inches, uh, two inches. I actually, I started a bunch of peas to transplant outside as I'm telling you to direct seed them. Um, <laughs> and I am going to be planting some of them every six inches and some of them every two inches. So, and you can always thin them, but if you know exactly what spacing you um, want, then um, over sowing slightly does guarantee you a better germination and, you know, have enough plants that if you have any that don't germinate, but you also don't want to just waste seeds. So knowing what you're going in, um, whether you have to thin or whether you're planting them exactly where you want them, that's a good thing to know. And then we're going to just cover that up. We're going to tamp it down, which is just like using our hand or um, a tool potentially to just um, essentially just firm it um, so that the soil and the seed has great contact. Um, and then we'll water it in. We want to water gently, but thoroughly. So we don't want to just like blast it with water and walk away. We really want to do that very gently, essentially slowly, um, gently and slowly. So that will ensure that the seeds, the soil has um, gotten properly moistened all the way through. So it's not just wet on top and then um, not soaking through. So um, that is generally how you direct seed. And, you know, we can do that with lots of different things. Again, something like a pepper and tomato, this would not work that well for, but there are lots of things that we can direct seed and that we do direct seed um, on the farm. Um, in terms of um, plants for transplanting, um, there's obviously multiple ways you can do it. You can do, um, purchasing plants, obviously, that's a great way to do it. This is a photo from May Market at Phipps. I do believe they are doing that again this year. Um, we are going to um, hopefully have seedlings for sale at Garden Dreams for Mother's Day weekend. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that by putting this out into the universe, I'm not uh, you know, jinxing the timeline and, and uh, that it will bring us uh, good luck for finishing up our, gre our greenhouses. Um, but you can also grow your own. And tomorrow we are doing a class all about seed starting at home. Um, and that's a, a webinar that we do have space in if anybody is interested in that. So growing your own or purchasing them. There's lots of nurseries that have a great selection. We sell plants through Grow Pittsburgh. We pick varieties that we um, have grown on our farms and really love, as well as um, things that we're always trying new things with. Um, but there's lots of really great local um, nurseries that have an awesome plant selection as well. So for transplanting, um, which is just the opposite of direct seeds, instead of putting seeds directly in the ground, we're going to plant a seedling and we're going to plant that where it's going to grow. That um, are things like I mentioned, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those are the nightshade family. Those just take too long to grow to, from seed. We really need that jump start. We need to be putting a nice, healthy, big plant in the ground um, after May 15 to really get a harvest from those things. Um, and then flowers are also very commonly transplanted. Like I mentioned, we transplant a lot of things on our farm because we just need our timeline to be um, you know, a little bit uh, tighter to be able to have successions and harvests every single week. So we do transplant a lot more than, um, than I do at home because I know that um, we can have a, an exact um, harvest schedule that way. So um, these are probably the most common ones, but there's lots of things. We transplant onions and um, like I said, we do also transplant beans and okra, all sorts of things. So when we're thinking about transplanting, this is also um, at Shiloh. These are our tomatoes and pepper beds. And as I mentioned, um, thinking about spacing between rows and between plants, you can see here this bed closest to us. Those are peppers. We grow those in two in our three foot bed. We grow two rows of those um, and we grow them a foot and a half apart. The next bed is tomatoes, and we only do one row of those. Pep peppers and tomatoes growth habit, even though they're both in the nightshade family, they, they grow so significantly different that we only grow one row of tomatoes. And other people at other farms to you know, do totally different things, but at our farm, we do one row down the center of tomatoes to get a nice big trellis that can be sturdy and hold the plants up. And then for peppers, we do two rows um, and you can see the strings are on the, those little plants already. So trying to make sure we have a nice 
strong start to the season so that when they start to grow big and tall. Um, so that's really important is understanding how, you know, how much space each plant requires and then um, and some of that will be experimentation, you know, figuring out what makes sense in your garden. Um, we are keeping the space. We could certainly plant these closer together, but we are keeping that space because we want to make sure we're cutting down um, on disease by allowing more airflow between the plants. Um, and obviously sunlight is super important for tomatoes and peppers. If they don't have that sunlight, um, the six plus hours, then they just won't produce um, very much fruit. So uh, this is a good example of sort of how we do even things that are similar and we grow quite um, closely. These are two different examples of that peppers and tomatoes. And just like with, um, with the seeding, direct seeding, we are going to get our beds ready. Often we're adding compost. We do um, amend our beds every year based on our soil test, um, but compost is always a great option um, to add nutrients. We, you, we usually add it about every other year um, based on our soil test. This year we're doing some, building some brand new beds with um, compost and we're excited about that. But again, breaking up any clumps that's not because they're tiny seeds, but then because, you know, moisture might be held differently and otherwise your spacing could be off if you have a big rock or something like that. So um, breaking up any clumps, holes or trenches to appropriate depth and spacing. You could see in this photo here, we had cut holes in the plastic in advance. So we knew exactly where all of the plants were going to go. And that plastic really um, works so well for warming up the soil in the springtime it holds moisture and also is a great weed block. It is plastic, um, which, you know, there's, there's something to be said about that, but it is a huge labor saver on our end as well. So this, in this picture here, we're getting the beds ready at Shiloh. You can see we've got a, a string that runs um, from the front to the back. That's for creating our paths. We just use a shovel and dig the paths each year. Um, to create the beds. And that's because this is a section of the farm that we do till. There's a section of the farm that we don't till, but this is a section we do till. So we just turn over the soil in that whole plot and then dig new beds um, with a shovel to create each bed and path. And we do about a foot in the paths, which can be quite tight in the, in the season when all the plants are big, um, but we try and grow as much as possible. So uh, the beds are about three feet and the pads are about a foot. If you have more space, give yourself a better path. That's uh, definitely helpful. And then um, similar to, um, you know, direct seeding, we're going to put the plant um, into the ground. This is uh, re carefully removing the plant from the container, whether it's a plastic pot or these onions actually were grown in individual cells, but we also sometimes just grow them in a big flat and just loosen them up. Onions are really uh, resilient crops. So you can see they're laying them down in a trench there and then we'll just um, cover those up and they'll, they'll be sideways for a little bit, but then they'll start to grow upright uh, within a week or so. And um, onions are really great. Those will get planted um, about a yeah, half inch or one inch apart if we're doing just scallions and then closer to four inches if we're doing full size onions. A really great trick for if you have a tighter space but want to grow both scallions and um, larger onions, a great thing to do is plant them every half inch or inch. I think we usually do about an inch between them. Um, and then as you harvest scallions, if you're um, strategic about plant um, harvesting every few, then you can allow those ones that stay in the ground to grow to full size. So that's a thing that we will do um, in the farm depending on uh, what kinds of things we're growing. This year we're growing some that are specifically for scallions, which is exciting too. So um, we'll tuck that soil right around it, firm it, uh, just like with the, the seeds, making sure that we have good contact with the soil to the plants. Um, so the roots are nice um, and established there. And then we um, have here to water in gently with fertilizer. I really like doing a little transplant solution. Um, we do a thing, uh, just a watered down fish emulsion, sometimes with seaweed. Um, you can add molasses for, um, for trace minerals. There's lots of different things that you can do. Um, sometimes we do humates, really depending on what we have on hand and, and um, whatnot. We will, I think watering in with, with fertilizer is a really nice little boost. It'll reduce um, the amount of transplant shock the plant will experience because you know it is 
even when the plants are healthy and the ground is ready and everything, all the conditions are right, they are still going through a big process to get ripped out of their container and put into the ground and all of that. So the fertilizer, um, like a fish emulsion, is a really great way to just sort of uh, cut down on that transplant shock. Questions about direct seeding or transplanting? Yes, please, please send them uh, down into the chat and I will bring them up. Um, it looks like Deanna had a quick question about your seed starting seminar. She was wondering if it was going to be recorded for a later viewing. If mm. That is a good question. I do believe I am recording it. I don't know where it will be accessible, but if somebody wants to email me, they're welcome to, and then we can um, try and get that, that webinar out to people. Yeah. Okay. And Margaret had a question about using seed packets um, from last year. And I said, go. <laughs> my, my experience is yes, they might have a lower germination rate, but as long as they aren't moldy to go ahead and use them, the seeds last a long time. I don't know if you have experience with that. Yeah, so there's, um, that's a great thing. So, so many kinds of seeds will last, especially if they are kept um, in like good um, condition or, uh, yeah. Essentially, the, the cooler and darker that they can be without moisture, that is really great. So um, at, the, at work, we keep them in a fridge with, um, so that they have a consistent um, temperature throughout the year. Um, but certainly at my house, I do not keep my seeds in the fridge and those are uh, just in my basement where it is cooler, but certainly not as cold as a fridge. Um, and it is important to know that some seeds have a much longer life than other seeds. So something like lettuce and parsnip, which is a surprising one. Um, and there's something else that I think onion seeds too, they, there, there are things that do not last as long. So something like lettuce seeds, I think they often say they'll last one year. And that is, uh, you know, a seed company doesn't want you to, to tell you that it will last lots of years um, if that isn't a guarantee. Even, it doesn't mean that they'll all die and you can't plant them, but your germination might go down lower than their, you know, um, than their policy or, or what they want their standard to be. So they'll tell you that it'll last a year. Um, that being said, um, there are many things that'll last five years, especially if kept in the fridge. Um, usually the larger seeds, squash and um, peas and beans, those will last longer. I will try to find, um, there is definitely um, a resource out there where it says all the different numbers of years that they will last. Um, and that's always a helpful thing. I often, especially if I'm direct seeding, throw a couple extra in there if they're older. And um, otherwise, uh, what I used to do at the YMCA when I managed the garden program was just reuse any of the really old seeds that were not no longer germinating well to turn them into like fun art projects and make seed mosaics and things like that. So um, always ways to repurpose, but um, they can also be composted if they're not. If they really don't have germination. I wouldn't pour your seeds in them if they um, have any life to them. And a seed swap, um, Grow Pittsburgh hosts a seed swap every year. This year, it's going to look a little bit different than that. Um, usually, it's in partnership with the library um, at the Carnegie Library. Um, the main library. And um, so the, a seed swap is a really great way that if you have some seeds that you opened and you tried and either didn't like them or they didn't grow well, or you just got way too many, like I did uh, because I went a little bit crazy. I don't have as much space as I bought seeds for. Um, swapping with other people so you can trade five seeds from one thing for another thing. That's a really great way if you do have some um, you know, not seeds that no longer grow, but just too many or um, are have already been opened and that kind of thing. Um, There's also, I, if if you guys are familiar with our neighborhoods and the, um, the surrounding neighborhoods and how they're the little libraries, you know, the libraries on a post yeah. kind of sprinkled throughout this year, uh, I forget what the organization is called, Swiss Vale seed sharing, something like that. But a lot of the little libraries have um, uh, kind of neighborhood neighbors yeah. who are sharing little packets of seeds. So you can kind of keep an eye out. It's very much like, you know, I threw in a couple, I picked up a couple collard greens. Like it's a, you know, you open it and you see if there's anything in there, but it is fun. So keep an eye out for something like that too. Yeah, that's definitely a great suggestion. Whoops. Um, so another- Go oh, ahead. 
it looks like Heidi had a question about pumpkin seeds. Okay. That if tried growing or drying pumpkin seeds from previous harvest and planting them the following year, but nothing grew, mm. um, is it possible for seeds to be sterile? Yeah, I mean, especially if they are not dried um, in proper conditions. And then um, the other thing is uh, that um, if the pumpkin wasn't allowed to fully ripen, it might not have gotten to the point, you know, plants often, um, they're they're producing fruit to produce seeds. So that plant wants to produce seeds because that is how it will grow again. So something like a pumpkin or a tomato that has lots of seeds inside of it, um, it does want to grow again. So, but we do have to let them fully ripen. So if we're picking pumpkins or getting them from, um, you know, say a farm stand or something like that, if they are not fully ripened and they're, especially if they're picked for aesthetic purposes instead, um, they just may not have, um, had the sort of the genetic information in it yet. So it could be a lot of things. It could be, you know, too moist. It could be that they were, they got too hot and, or, you know, it, it, I, without knowing the circumstances, it's hard to know, but certainly a lot of things could have happened if you did try and save the seeds and they didn't grow. So we'll have to have you back for a seed saving uh, oh, yeah. seminar at the end of the season. I know I would love that. And then Margaret just had a quick question. I'm not sure if this is what we're jumping into, but is there a certain type of compost to buy if you don't have mm. your own compost, like mushroom compost? Yeah, there's, I mean, there are a lot of different compost products out on, you know, in, in the market and you can buy some of them at um, certainly like big box stores, local nurseries, those kinds of things will have mushroom compost or um, leaf compost or just a bag of like, you know, something just labeled compost. Uh, certainly that exists. Those are um, nice products because likely they will be um, guaranteed seed free. Certainly the compost in my yard is not getting hot enough to kill the weed seeds that I'm putting into it. So I'm letting it sit for a long time before I'm putting it into my garden and also um, putting it into one of my little um, like black backyard compost bins so that it does heat up and get really nice um, and warm to kill those weed seeds. So buying a product is a nice way, but it can certainly get expensive. A company I really like is AgriCycle. They're located in Homewood and they um, have really wonderful compost. That is uh, the compost that we have at the Garden Resource Center through Grow Pittsburgh. And it's also who we buy, you know, yards and yards of compost for our farm. Um, oh, I just saw a thing about vermicompost, um, certainly worm, worm castings, all of those kinds of things are really nutrient dense ways to add fertility to the soil. So um, I would say, you know, it, it's really about personal preference, but mushroom compost is wonderful. You can also get leaf mulch. You can get all sorts of things to really amend both nutri nutrients and um, like sort of texture and structure of the soil. Um, Catherine, I saw, sent me a direct message asking um, how deep to plant seedlings. And that is a really great question and really depends on the plants that you are planting. So we bury our tomatoes really deep because all the little hairs on the side of the tomato stems and leaves will turn into roots. So we bury our tomatoes pretty deep, uh, as, essentially as deep as we can. So even if we're starting with a plant that is this tall to put out on the farm, we might bury it that much. So we just have the little tippy top above ground and all those roots underneath, we'll often remove the leaves. The leaves are not gonna, um, you know, the, they might just rot in the ground. So we remove those and bury them deep. Um, and all of that will get build a better root structure, which ultimately will make a healthier plant. Um, you can, if you look up pictures online, you can see some people like completely turn them sideways and do a trench planting method. I've never done that because we plant into the plastic. So it would be really hard to like dig it and plant it sideways. But the deeper that you can bury the plant while still having a nice size above it is great. That being said, you don't want like a leggy plant, but if you have a nice sturdy plant and you can bury that deep, that's um, really great for um, the longevity of the, the tomato and a productivity of it. 
That being said, most things you do not want to bury uh, deep like that. Most things you would just want to plant right at the soil line, whatever the um, container is that you're planting. We grow most of our seedlings that grow Pittsburgh in a three or a four inch pot. And we're just going to bury that to right to the soil line. So it's even with the, with the ground. We might dig it a little bit deeper just to loosen up the soil, um, maybe a little bit wider to loosen it up, but we're going to just keep that right at the, some things, if you bury the stem, they will just, um, like disintegrate, they'll just rot. Uh, we don't want that. So uh, planting right, if, if you don't know, just planting at the baseline, you're, the tomatoes are not gonna hurt from being planted that way. Certainly most people probably do plant their tomatoes right at the soil line. Um, but if you can bury the tomatoes a little bit deeper, that is, um, is a great, great way to have a really sturdy, strong plant. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna keep moving and that way we can make sure we can get to other questions as well. Um, so watering is one of the most challenging and most important things to get right in the garden. Um, if we do not water enough or, um, or over water, we can cause lots of issues with pests and diseases. So watering is a super important, it's really what, one of like the, the biggest skills, certainly in our greenhouse as well. Um, that is uh, one of the, the most important tasks. Being gentle is always good. Watering the soil, not the leaves, anytime you can. Um, aiming a hose or a watering can right at the soil rather than on the tomatoes, um, especially because there can be soil, um, waterborne diseases and things like that. Um, watering well, less often is better than watering short amounts of time, lots of times. One deep water is much better because what happens is the plant then puts roots further down into the ground and creates better drought resistance throughout the season. If, the water, if, if you think about it, if you're just watering it and the water stays shallow, those roots are just gonna stay right at the surface there. And then they're always gonna be trying to find water there. Whereas there's groundwater and um, better drought resistance lower. So the deeper we can get the, train the roots to grow, um, the better ultimately that the plant will do, especially around um, drought resistance. So watering for, a, um, you know, like I said, a long time, less frequently, um, especially if you have an irrigation system, uh, that is a really great way to just turn it on. Turning it on once a week versus every day is beneficial for the long run of the plants. Um, so uh, certainly if you're growing in a container, um, you know, water, you might have to water every day regardless because it just, you can water it thoroughly one day and the next day it might still need water. But certainly for the ground, deeper roots, encouraging those roots to grow deeper is best for the long haul. We do have a workshop coming up on May 3rd all about irrigation fundamentals. That's gonna be at Braddock Farms. Um, I don't have any information about signing up for that yet, but um, that's a really great one. If you do have a garden that's established and you need help with figuring out long-term um, watering plans, there's the irrigation workshop all about that. Um, obviously weeds are a big part of our, of our gardens, especially here in Pittsburgh. Some people might have Japanese knotweed or something, you know, so challenging to tackle. Thankfully I have knock on wood, have not seen any of that in my yard. I, um, am thankful for that. I do have lots of creeping Charlie and lots of other things, but making sure that you can pull the roots out fully is really important. Um, otherwise, if you're just pulling the top off, it's just gonna shoot, send up new shoots and um, you're never really getting to the uh, heart of the problem if the roots stay in. So pulling out the roots um, is really important. You can see this image on top is uh, grass and the root systems on grass, if you've ever tried to pull them, you know it. It is incredible. They can be this long and you can see exactly where it's about to shoot up new uh, growth. And so getting the roots out is really important. You can see um, the suggestion to uh, hoe the soil when it's small. The smaller the weeds, the easier they are to tackle, making sure that you're getting them when they're small. Um, that'll be a, much easier than the long run. Trying to pull big established weeds is so much harder than little ones. So keeping on it and um, using, um, you know, hand tools are great for that or long handled tools so that you can stand upright and not hunched over. Um, 
finding the right tool. There are so, so, so many different kinds of hose on the market. And so finding the right one with the right angle, or um, some of them are flat, some of them have a curve. Um, I really like this a Korean hand hoe that um, has a nice wooden handle and a nice uh, sharp angled blade on it. That's one that I personally like. I also use it for transplanting. Um, this weed on the bottom, anyone know what that is? You can put it in the chat. I bet some of you have seen it, uh, potentially even growing in the cracks of the sidewalk, purslane. Yep, that's exactly right. And purslane is an edible uh, plant. So we call it a weed because it's a, you know, my dad always told me a weed is just a plant out of place. Purslane is edible. And um, so <laughs> there was a time that we had so much of it growing on the farm. We were selling it at our farm stand. And um, it is a really delicious plant. It's got um, really awesome texture. It's um, like a succulent. It's got a lot of water in it. So it's a wonderful addition to salads and things like that. So just because it's a weed, a plant out of place, doesn't mean it, it doesn't have medicinal values. Another one is lamb's quarter. It's a really delicious um, weed that grows all over um, and is actually uh, quite nutritious, much more nutritious than like something like lettuce would be. Um, and again, there's a weed control and prevention class. I believe that's that one might be a, no, I'm not sure where that one is, but it's going to be in June. <laughs> so anyways, there's lots of, lots of workshops coming up that all these topics will cover. So um, thinking about mulching, there's lots of different materials you can use. We talked about sheet mulching when just establishing a garden using cardboard, straw, wood chips, leaves, all of those. I of course didn't even put plastic on there, which is um, you saw in a previous photo we do use as a mulch for tomatoes and peppers. We're gonna be experimenting with some of that. We actually tried um, brown paper, craft paper, as a uh, mulch for zucchinis. We plant um, zucchinis and summer squash on our farm every, uh, every three weeks. And generally they, we leave them in the ground for a full month of production. And so we knew that that would be a, a thing that we wouldn't need to last the entire season, but would like to last for that entire succession. So we planted the um, uh, zucchinis right into the craft paper, which was a really fun experiment. And I would like to do that again, because um, it then starts to break down. And right as you're sort of that succession of the zucchini is nearly done, that um, paper can just be incorporated back into the bed because it's already starting to biodegrade. The water's starting to break it down. It's coming in contact with the soil, which has bacteria and you know mycorrhizal and, and fungi and all of that, that will start to break down that paper. So that was a really fun thing. So if you have some uh, brown craft paper sitting around, that might be a fun thing to try. And we want to mulch for multiple reasons, but that's a great thing to help with water retention. Again, wanting to keep that moisture in the bed having that moisture as uh, deep as possible, great for weed suppression and for soil building, something like wood chips, straw, leaves, cardboard, all of that's gonna break down and add to soil life. Questions about that stuff. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to get into pests and diseases, which really should be its own workshop, um, but I'm going to talk about some things a bit. <laughs> Doesn't look like we currently have questions. Okay, great. I mean, we can just keep moving and then have yeah. more questions. I'm moving. sure pests and diseases will, will uh, bring up some questions. So garden pests. I am sure if you all have had gardens that you have seen some of these things. Um, the one on the left is probably a cabbage white or a cabbage worm, um, but there's also cabbage loopers, which look very similar, but move like an inchworm. Um, and you might think that they're the same thing, but there's actually two different kinds of caterpillars. One is the cabbage looper, one is the cabbage worm. Both of those um, do turn into moths, but, um, they on the plants can be extremely devastating. Aphids are the next photo there. The lower one is a flea beetle, which is so teeny tiny. Um, you can see the hairs on that leaf. Those flea beetles can be so destructive. They just, um, some bugs, you know, you can see the caterpillar will just take big chunks out of it. The aphids are sap suckers. So they'll um, suck the juices from the leaves. And so you'll see some yellowing and that kind of thing. Um, anybody know what's going on, on in the top right? picture. This is one of one of my favorite things to find in the garden. It's 
kind of crazy. It's a, it's a little bit of a wacky thing, but it's a very, a very good thing to see in your garden, especially if you have, um, are intentionally planting things to attract beneficial insects. So this picture here is a tomato hornworm. Um, I don't, can you see my mouse? when I move. Okay, great. So this body here is the tomato hornworm. You can see its horn right here. Um, it's in the same family as the tobacco hornworm, but this is a tomato hornworm. And these things can get so big. It can be as big as your finger. They're so, uh, they're like very, very soft bodied and they stick to the plants really hard. So you have to like kind of pull them off. Anyways, these rice looking grains off of their back are I hope nobody is queasy here, but they are parasitic wasp eggs. So a parasitic wasp has laid its eggs inside of the tomato hornworm. And now those eggs are emerging out its back and that caterpillar, which if you've ever had one on your tomato plants, you know, they can be, I mean, you can lose the entire top of your tomato plant so quickly because they just, they're big caterpillars. If you've ever had a little caterpillar, you know how much damage they can do. Those big ones, they can eat the entire top of your tomato plant new flowers and all of that. So we don't like the tomato hornworms and this parasitic wasp. We have a bad connotation with wasps, but these wasps, parasitic ones, and or predatory or beneficial, any of those words that um, we use around them, they are very teeny tiny. They almost look, look more like a fruit fly than they do like a big stinging, you know, uh, you know, yellow jacket or wasp that we know as like scary bad wasps. These are more like um, little you know, things you would shoo out, of the, shoo out of your face. So anyways, this is really exciting to see in the garden because that means now there are gonna be um, new parasitic wasps being born in the garden and uh, repeating the cycle of taking out our pests. That's a really great way to um, not have to spray any chemicals or anything like that. We have the nature doing its work um, with taking care of the pests in the garden. Garden pests, I think I saw a message here about the um, squash vine borer. Someone had sent me a message directly and man, they are so challenging. This is a picture here of the squash vine borer. It's a little caterpillar that will climb up inside the stem of the, um, in the cucurbit family, usually squash. Um, and this top picture is what the damage looks like. So it looks like it, you know, if you don't know that it, there's a, uh, caterpillar inside the plant or that little grub um, of the vine borer. You might think it's a disease because of the wilting or because of that, but it's actually because of the squash vine borer. And you can see that because you can actually see the channeling um, inside the uh, way down at the base at the soil line. You'll see a little bit of like little yellow, almost kind of like what this is. You would see where it's probably something that has buried inside. And they are extremely challenging. We get them every year. The earlier successions generally don't have them. So a lot of times we just try and beat the squash vine borer. Um, same with powdery mildew, which we also all, um, always get on our, our zucchinis, which we cut some of the leaves off and try and mitigate that. But um, garden pests can do lots of different things. They can do leaf damage. They can do fruit damage. Uh, those tomato hornworm will definitely eat the fruits that are on the plant as well. Um, vine and root damage. Um, and also something that's really challenging about garden pests is that they can also spread disease. The cucumber beetle um, will spread disease all throughout the garden. So just because uh, it is an insect, it doesn't necessarily mean it's um, eating it. It can also be spreading diseases. So garden pests are real challenging, but um, watching out for them and figuring out what you have is most important. And then there's a couple of things you can do. Um, mechanical controls would be something like a row cover, sticky traps. I don't love sticky traps out in a garden because anything can get stuck to it. But if you have something that you um, like really cannot control any other way, and certainly we use them in the greenhouse as well, but out where I honey, we don't see honeybees inside of our greenhouse, but outside in the garden, I don't love sticky traps and hand picking. You would not believe how much hand picking we do of caterpillars. We have chickens on our farm. So uh, the chickens just get a little treat of the caterpillars on uh, from, especially from our brassicas and things that we always see loopers, cabbage whites, all of those every year we see those. Um, so we just feed them to the chickens. Um, hand picking is also great for something like a harlequin beetle, which are bigger. If you can find eggs, that's definitely, um, hand picking doesn't just have to be for the insects. It can also be for the eggs. Um, looking on the underside of leaves, 
for, um, yeah, vine borers for um, harlequin beetles have really beautiful eggs. They are black and white and have this like beautiful swirl to them. They almost look like a little, um, and they're and they're all attached. They're very neat. Anyways, you should look up a picture of the um, harlequin beetle eggs. Um, and then biological controls. So row cover can be a couple of different things. So that that is the picture there is of row cover. We also use insect netting, which is really nice because it lets more sunlight. It doesn't provide any temperature um, whereas a row cover, some row covers, the ones that we use at the farm at about six degrees um, underneath that row cover of warmth. So something, if we're trying to extend the season, it can help with both temperatures as well as bugs. Um, at the farm, we also use insect netting where we don't wanna be increasing the temperatures, but wanna ke be keeping the insects or groundhogs or any of those kinds of things out. The insect netting is really nice. And it's almost like a tool material, like from a tutu. Um, it's uh, really like stretchy and um, has very fine holes. So even the um, flea beetles are not supposed to be able to get in, but of course last year they still did. You'd have to have it really secure to the ground, which we don't have a great system for. Uh, biological controls, having the beneficial insects to eat your pests, just like I talked about with the tomato hornworm. And that's really about having um, lots of different sources of, of food for the um, beneficial insects. So that would be uh, ladybugs are really great for aphids, praying mantises also. They're a wonderful garden um, beneficial insect. These um, parasitic wasps, lots of different things can be really beneficial in the garden. Um, aside from just, um, you know, pollination, which we also need in our garden, having them do some of that work of eating our pests is really great. Companion planting, um, that can look a lot of different ways. I had mentioned earlier, planting the marigolds near the tomatoes. There's some, um, you know, stories that those help uh, attract uh, beneficial insects to tomatoes. Um, oftentimes they'll say things like things that are really stinky, like onions might, uh, keep, uh, pests away as well, or something, um, like lavender and rosemary and oregano perennial herbs that have lots of scent to them, um, wouldn't maybe deter something from coming and eating. Although I have not found that to be true for deer, <laughs> uh, in my yard, I think I have a picture coming up, um, of the like seven deer that just have so much fun in my yard. And um, my experience planting lavender and rosemary, they just pulled them out of the ground and tossed them to the side. So uh, <laughs> that did not work for me, but hopefully it works better for you. And then um, using selective pesticides. I think that this is an option only as a last resort. Um, I had mentioned yesterday the OMRI, O-M-R-I, you can see that here on this label. So we do know that it is organically approved. I would absolutely say do not spray anything that is not organically approved because so many of those are so broad spectrum. And if you, are, you think you're spraying for something like an aphid, but you're also killing ladybugs, bumblebees, honeybees, all those kinds of things. So, or something that anything that would come in contact with it, like a monarch caterpillar or a swallowtail. So really being so, so intentional with what um, things that we're using. Um, that being said, we do use some of these as a last resort. Um, I really like the diatomaceous earth is really great. It's um, a crushed up powder. We use that for flea beetles. Um, and last year we just like put it uh, along the edge of where um, insects would get underneath our netting as well as underneath. Um, and that worked all right. Something like that is challenging because if we get a rain, then all of that gets washed away. So it is something you have to stay more on top of, but can be a great way to, um, and that one is a lot uh, less, I think, um, detrimental than these other things. But these are all things that you can and we do use as a last resort. Bt is a good bacteria for soft bodied things like caterpillars and larvae. That would be for your cabbage loopers and for um, uh, cabbage whites and those kinds of things. That would be the Bt. The neem is a uh, tree oil and that's for both for diseases and bugs. We do probably, I think we probably use neem oil the most. Um, and again, very selectively. Pyrethrin is from the chrysanthemum family, and that is a pesticide, so dealing with pest issues. 
And then insecticidal soap, as it says, is for insects. Um, that's for like aphids and scale and white flies. Um, that's when you would use an insecticidal soap. That being said too, sometimes just like blasting a plant with a, a hose, as I tell you not to uh, water <laughs> the leaves. Um, if you just blast it with a hose, especially our small plants, a lot of times that will just knock them off and you know, um, you can move on from there then. But um, as I mentioned yesterday, the Garden Resource Center is such a wonderful, it's opening day is tomorrow. I put that date in there. I didn't, I forgot that it's tomorrow. So opening day is tomorrow. You can get all of these kinds of things and resources there, which is really nice because maybe you want to try diatomaceous earth, but don't want to buy a big bag of it. It's a great way to be able to go get a handful, try it out. And um, I believe they are taking new members this year. They were not last year because of COVID, but um, it's a really wonderful resource. Last year, I believe the uh, membership was $40. I'm not sure if that went up this year. It very may, very well may have, but um, you do get monthly um, options to get compost, topsoil, wood chips, cover crops, potentially seedlings, insect and disease control, all of those kinds of things. So it's a really, really wonderful resource. I go there. I always have to remind myself to get my personal um, <laughs> allotment of all my stuff. And um, we'll be going there because we just planted ginger and turmeric in our greenhouse. So we're going to be um, going to get compost to amend those beds too. So, um, and obviously insects are only one part of that. This is my yard. <laughs> So uh, if anybody has had deer in your yard, you know how challenging they are. You can see we're starting to put up a deer fence, but um, we were not done at that point yet. And, um, and honestly, I still see deer poop inside of our fence. So it's still not keeping them out totally, but I've got some, uh, so a couple more things to do. So, you know, pests can be all sorts of things, deer, rabbits, groundhogs, birds, moles, voles, dogs, cats, you know, any kind of thing can be um, destructive in the garden. And so really identifying what kind of pests we've got and then building a um, plan from there. Uh, for smaller things like um, groundhogs, there are safe traps at the GRC as well as animal control. They will kill that animal if they come and get it though. So um, just know, know that. Um, there are lots of groundhogs in this uh, in this community and we have a lot of issues with that. I, at um, Shiloh, so we do use um, row covers and insect netting, like I mentioned. That's partially for insects, but it's a lot for the groundhogs and deer have started showing up there uh, in the last couple of years. So trying to figure out what the best mode of action is for that. Birds are obviously very challenging because you'd have to net an entire thing to be able to keep them out, um, especially if you're growing something like a berry bush, um, something that the birds find very attractive. Uh, those can be certainly very challenging. Um, but the barriers like netting and fences, that's definitely the best way to go, um, especially if you're trying to cut down on sprays and all of those things. So um, yeah. Um, feathered and furry pests. Oof. Um, okay, moving on to diseases, which this is a really challenging thing to um, talk about because so many things, you know, it's, it's really hard to know what anyone is experiencing. And even, you know, even I've been growing, um, you know, this is my 12th year farming, but every year I still have to figure out what, what do these brown spots on this plant mean? Um, and diseases can look lots of different ways. It can be discoloration, modeling, mold growth, stunted or abnormal growth, um, curling leaves. It can be a lot of different things. This is septoria leaf spot on a tomato. We get this every year at the farm. And um, so there's lots of things that you can watch for, for diseases. Um, sometimes I do think that, uh, especially for new gardeners, that anytime somebody sees any kind of abnormality, they think it's something really bad is happening. But oftentimes, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be something so bad as a disease. It could um, even just be that it's, you know, got some, a little bit of sunburn or, a, you know, maybe it was a pest, but um, definitely brown spots are usually a good sign that that is um, a disease. This is uh, bean rust on a bean plant. That's a soil borne disease. These can come from lots of different ways. It can be spread through soil, wind, water, humans. When we move through the garden, we can be carrying um, the tomato diseases. We should be very careful. If you see tomato disease on one plant and then you brush past all the others, you could unknowingly be spreading that disease. Certainly animals and insects, like I mentioned, the cucumber beetle. Um, oh, those are so terrible. Um, 
And then you also potentially could have infected seeds or seedlings. Again, why it's important to buy um, from a reputable seed source. So you know that those seeds you're buying were disease free um, and not gr grown on a plant that may already then have that genetic material in that plant. Um, and then seedlings can certainly be um, diseased and you may not know that yet, but certainly buying healthy looking plants to begin with is a great way to, um, to at least have a good start. Um, soil, that's why we rotate crops a lot of times at the farm. You know, I think we, we talk about rotating crops a lot. And for someone like me, I don't have a gigantic space. Even at Shiloh, we only have a quarter acre there. So we are rotating. We rotate the tomatoes and peppers every year, but realistically, the tomatoes this year are gonna grow two feet from where they grew last year. So um, it really is just about trying to um, move that around so that uh, that's for both insects and pests. I, we mentioned it yesterday that insects can overwinter in the soil, rotating those crops, um, even the little bit, you know, it may or may not be a super effective strategy if we don't have 200 acres. Um, definitely crop rotation is huge in like, um, in monocrops and you know industrial agriculture but i think it's just a good practice to be rotating the best that we can so um and then obviously wind and water can be really challenging in a way that we can't um, necessarily control water that i should have mentioned that that plastic mulch that we use that does really help because then there's um and and all mulches but the plastic mulch especially will prevent water from splashing up on the leaves so if there is any um to, you know, diseases that are spread through water for tomatoes, that soil, it won't splash up from the soil or it won't, the water won't splash up because we're irrigating right underneath that plastic. And so there's a lot less spread um, by just mulching the ground. That's an immediate way to help with um, both soil and water spread diseases. That being said, uh, we, when we um, water or after it rains, we do not walk through the tomato field until the plants are dry. Because if there is any um, disease on that in that water or um, that's on the plants, we just by walking through can spread so easily. So um, making sure that the plants are dry before we harvest, before we do anything like that. Certainly if we're pruning the tomatoes, make sure those plants are dry. That's that not just for tomatoes, that's for everything, but tomatoes are a good, good example because they can be taller than you. And then as you walk through, you're just uh, spreading that all around. Um, so uh, open invitation for disease, certainly there's things that we can do to reduce that. Moisture stress can be overwatering or underwatering, and that can be an invitation for um, disease and, and for pests. Temperature stress, if we are planting something at the inappropriate season, either too early in the spring, um, it may not kill the plant, but it might just be um, you know, too cold for it to really do anything and then um, may invite disease or obviously that can go the other way and we can plant something that um, doesn't like the heat and that can cause stress. And um, really the healthiest plants you can have, the more you'll reduce the disease and pests. But we see all of these every year, even when we have good practices because it is still nature. We don't have um, total control over our climates. Too much or too little nutrition. We keep talking about amending the soil. You can have too much um, you know, nutrition. So you don't wanna, definitely wanna, if you're buying a bag, make sure you're reading those instructions, following the amount to apply for the appropriate space. Or if you're getting a soil test, don't over apply. More is not always better, especially for um, fertilization. That's where we start getting runoff and then it's going back into the water stream. So making sure we're just applying what the plants need for that season, that's perfect. Um, tight spacing, if we're planting things too close, um, it can, if there's not a chance for wind or sun to get there, then um, they might, that might also either spread disease or just cause disease by um, inviting a stressful situation. And then injury, if anything is uh, <laughs> funny to talk about injury in a plant, but if there's um, uh, you know any injury to the leaves, insects and diseases move right in. So again, big, strong, healthy plants when we go, when we start, um, or seeds, certainly seeds are a great option too. Um, tools in the garden. This was in my old, this is another picture that my friend Quelsey took. This is inside the YMCA tool shed, um, making sure that we have clean tools, especially for pests and diseases. Uh, we do not want to be just using a tool and then spreading disease on 
you know, unknowingly when we prune our tomatoes, if we have any um, instance of disease, we're sanitizing our pruners between each cut. So not each cut, each plant, I should say, but that is a lot when you have 200 tomato plants. <laughs> so um, making sure our tools are clean, making sure that anything that is broken on them, we are fixing or replacing and that we have good storage for our tools because that really is gonna make such a huge difference in the garden. If we have um, useful, effective, efficient tools, gardening can be so, so much easier. Um, and at the Garden Resource Center, if you have any questions about tools, they'll show you how to use them. The nice thing is you can try out a couple different kinds of things there if you're um, wanting to try a couple different kinds of pruners or that kind of thing, because there are so many tools on the market and finding the right one for you is really um, what it's all about. So again, lots of workshops coming up. Please keep an eye on our website because we'll have lots of other things um, coming up. Tomorrow is my next workshop. If you want to hang out for three days in a row, you can get a ticket to that. Um, but yeah, so I, um, I know we've got a couple more minutes here. If anybody has any final questions, um, I really appreciate everybody's um, engagement in this. And thanks so much to the library for putting this on. It's been so great. So well, this has been awesome. I think we've all gotten, we've all heard a lot of really good information today. <laughs> There's a lot to take in. Let's see. If you have questions, throw them in the chat. Christine says, I want to plant in my mother's yard, but I think she has moles and voles and groundhogs and not sure what to do. I will just jump in a second and say, I also have this problem. And like, you can put up fences and stuff, which is probably the better guaranteed way. But a couple of years ago, I got this gadget from Aldi that vibrates and lets out like a piercing Whoa. sound, but I can't hear it. Like the teen, my next door neighbor that like is a teen boy who, when he mows the grass, it like drives him nuts. But like, <laughs> so if you have kids, maybe not the best, but like, I can't hear it. And the elderly neighbors around me can't hear it. So um, oh my gosh. it really worked though. I had some burrowing in my vegetable beds. Mm -hmm. And once I had that going, there it go. Yeah, those can be so challenging, especially because they're underground. I, I always see like in our um, little like farming community, like Facebook things, it's always about getting a cat. <laughs> That's like everybody's solution. If you have voles, get a cat or a dog, I'm sure. But um, that is not, not an option for me. So um, they, they are so, so challenging, anything that's underground. So maybe I'll have to figure out that, Allison, because I just um, started, you know, going outside to see, and there's just, try, I can see exactly where they, as the ground settled over the winter, I can see exactly where they're going. And they're just like, have these expansive <laughs> sets of tunnels underneath my, um, in, all through my little apple orchard and through um, my front herbs um, and flower garden. So um, sneaky. Yes. And groundhogs, you know, groundhogs are, you know, personally we trap them and, um, call animal control, but, um, because we, we have to outweigh or, or, um, you know, we, we put priority on growing food for people to eat. And so, yeah. I think you can make groundhogs do too, but um, <laughs> I had a friend who did that one year. It was <laughs> like I felt like I was living in a different time. Yeah, not um, not my style, but certainly yeah, no, it was like happy it. groundhog day. I guess what we're eating. <laughs> but all right, Jane wants to know what is the best way to clean tools. Yeah, that's a great question. There's, um, I mean, certainly for um, like routine maintenance, just making sure that you're knocking as much of the soil off before you put it away. Um, every year at the end of the year, we often like will do um, some oil and a bucket of sand and just getting like some grittiness to remove any of the bits, but um, sharpening your tools. I am very notoriously bad at sharpening my tools, but that's a really great way to um, keep them working really well. Um, but just honestly, like keeping the soil off of them will improve the life of the plant or, or of the tool for so much longer. Um, but yeah, I think um, we will put like a little bit of oil in a bucket of sand and just like um, stab is not a great word, but you know, um, put the, the tool through that and that will create like a nice abrasive way to clean um, the stuff off of the plants. So, yeah. Go. And Austin had a story about a tomato from school that he wanted to tell. Here, I'll unmute you for a second, Austin, and you can tell your story. So, hi, I, I, 
Um, so I was at, um, when I was back in my school day, um, we actually were um, building, like we were had our own little greenhouse at our school and stuff. And we were growing plants and stuff. And our teachers like, why don't we try to grow tomatoes together and stuff like that. So we each brought like three different kinds of tomatoes home. And like a like couple of weeks after I brought those tomatoes home, they completely like grew like seven feet tall. And <laughs> like, I probably had like buckets of tomatoes for like all year round pretty much, which is. Wow. We it's a tomato I had success pitched, story. I had a picture of it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So mm. that's awesome. I love hearing people's um, success stories with growing, uh, especially tomatoes. If they're they're given you know a good environment, they will totally take off. Our tomatoes last year at the farm were growing up and then all the way back down over that I was like, I had to like crawl on my hands and knees to harvest the tomatoes. Like, this is not <laughs> how this is supposed to go. So um, yeah, it, that's great. Thanks for sharing that story, Austin. Um, oh any God. other questions with our last couple minutes here? Thank you all for your, for your thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, we got through a lot. I feel like so much of what we learned, we could even delve like each individual part could be its own session. Well, I, I mean, we really probably do almost have a workshop on each one of these for the throughout the rest of the year. So um, we, another important thing to sort of mention is that through Grow Pittsburgh, we have sort of a beginner's track. I'm teaching a bunch of workshops um, with Tara at Churchview this summer. Some of them will be in person because she's got a much larger farm than my spaces. Um, and we did them last year as well. And we're able to keep everyone distance, everyone wore masks. And um, it was really wonderful to be able to do some of those in person. So we will be doing some in person. Um, we'll be doing more webinars, um, our mushroom workshops coming up, all that. So we have that sort of like beginner gardeners, we call it um, backyard farm school. And then we also have a track which is more, um, if this was, you know, sort of a refresher for you, we also have a whole um, series of sort of the 201, the next level, if you've been growing and want to get more information about um, irrigation and those kinds of things, um, more weed control, those, there's a lot of um, that are great um, sort of next level classes. So, yeah. Great, and so I just threw into the chat, I made a web page for our organic gardening. And so I put the direct link in at ccmiller.org slash organic gardening, <laughs> that was straightforward. But if not, you can easily find it on our website under adult programming. And it has the recording from yesterday, It had, and then it will have the recording from today once I upload it. <laughs> and I threw in a bunch of links that we talked about. So if oh, there's great. anything you need to reference, it should be on that web page. And if there isn't, you can email me and I will find it. That's kind of what we do in the library. And I'll throw my email into the, oh, it's an email. Here's my work email. If you have any questions about what we learned today or want additional help, let's see. I'm glad you liked it, Diane. Lots of fun stuff. Um, Fortunato is in the Philippines. Wow. <laughs> I bet you have a different uh, different climate there where you can grow a lot of cool stuff. I'm glad Christine liked it and Louise liked it. Awesome. So that is the wrap up for today. And feel free to email me and H Hannah. Hannah, probably if you have like growing questions <laughs> and maybe you have anything on the library end. Um, and I will be putting together a list of my recommended books for gardening. Oh yeah, that's great. Stack. Excellent. We're working on uh, cleaning out our gardening shelves and because we're pretty small and um, I've been researching different ones to buy for our library. So there will be new ones coming, but I did want to just quickly mentioned since someone asked about companion planting. I think it was Christine. Yeah. Oh yeah, this thank is you. one of my favorite books. It's called Vegetables Love Flowers. Yeah. And if you want, to, it like gives, it's all organic and it tells you like specifically what to plant with what and has great pictures. One of the things I'm gonna be doing out of this book is it has a section on sunflowers and it says grow sunflowers and then grow your miniature pumpkins, which we talked about earlier, up them like a trellis. And so the sunflowers gather good pollinators and everything for your pump. Oh, she's got it too. It's a good book. I'm just saying. 
So, she yeah. also wrote one called Cool Flowers, which is it something- It's on my order list. I've been wanting that one. It's hard to get. There are like it's, no copies in the library. It's so good. Well, Allison, if you want to um, borrow my copy, <laughs> you're welcome to. This one I've um, planned my entire spring garden based on this book. It is um, very fun. I'm doing a lot more flowers that, as, as I've talked mostly about vegetables um, in these presentations. I at my house grow a ton of flowers. This picture here is of um, Autumn Beauty, the sunflower Autumn Beauty uh, with honeybees at Shiloh covered in pollen. I love that picture so much. So, um, but yeah, cool flowers this is a great gardening one. If you're not into vegetables, but want some flower um, tips, that's a really wonderful one. Yes, by Lisa Mason Ziegler. And she lives in a zone seven. So we're in a 6B. So a lot of her uh, recommendations kind of overlap with where we are, which is really convenient. So I threw the Vegetables Love Flowers and she also wrote the Cool Flowers book in, in the chat, if you guys are curious about that. And I'll put that on our website too. So that's all under that organic gardening uh, page for further, for future reference. Great. All right, well, we'll wrap up. We don't want to take up too much of your time. We had a lot of awesome information today. I just want to thank Hannah so much. This has been so helpful and really uh, touched on a lot of fun things. I think a lot of us will be working into our gardens. Great. All right, well, I hope everyone has a lovely evening and a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you at the library. Thank you.